through a couple slides right at the beginning, then we can do getting, you know, who you are, that kind of thing. And that's where we're at right at the moment. So I will, I will um, hopefully, I'm going to let a, a bit of silent time. Well, hello. It's now the 6th of August and Hiroshima Day for that matter. This is our science fiction meeting of the Tucson Hard Science, science fiction writers, artists, and readers. And we are so pleased and honored to host Ben Kuipers this morning, who will be speaking to us about the ethics and legal responsibilities of corporate, not corporate, excuse me, robotic personhood, but it's in some ways maybe like corporate personhood. Um, and we are so happy to have him today. And just before I do anything else, I have a couple uh, housekeeping slides here. And hopefully my slide advancer will advance. Well, I will try to advance here. It's not advancing real fast, but oh, here they are. Here are my buttons there. Oops, um, one at a time, guys. Okay. Here is our second slide and it is about our, we have a YouTube channel, the Tucson Hard Science SF channel, which you can find on YouTube. And we also have a satire that we put up just a couple of days ago. And I wrote it and we had some people from various places uh, that acted in it. It's, it's only mostly uh, sound, it's not uh, completely staged. So if you want to join our Planet Zoom, players, uh, give us a, write to us at sci-fi 2011 at gmail.com. And now please turn off your microphone unless you are speaking, place your comments into the chat window. And if you want extra information or to contact our speaker, please write to sci-fi 2011 at gmail.com. And now I will stop this share and we will be able to see each other. I will uh, <laughs> want you to maybe first, before we go to uh, Ben's talk, he might want to know who you all are. So I will start with Bill Adams and uh, you can unmute yourselves. Oh, hi. Thank you, Gloria. I am Bill Adams. I'm in Portland, Oregon, and I've been coming to these meetings for two or three years, and I'm very happy to meet the speaker today. I have an interest in robotics, artificial intelligence, and ethics. So, Just uh, go on. I The one I see next is William Taylor, Bill. Do you want to unmute yourself, Bill? There I go. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm way out past the casinos here in Tucson. I can't get to the real meetings that were at the Arizona Inn. But when I'm awake, I can try and come in on a Saturday morning for these. Uh, mostly I pre read for. David Brenn is all I've done. I haven't published anything myself. And for artificial intelligence, I'm trying to write an article on the one word Turing test, but that's all I can say on it. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Um, Karen? Karen, you can unmute. All of you are muted. There you go, okay. Hi, um, Karen Liptek. I have written um, many books, mainly for children and um, young adults on science and on Native Americans. And um, I have a lot of stuff I'm working on now that's on the, the new world coming. And we'll see where that goes. I don't know that much about Article and artificial intelligence, but I did read the article in the uh, New York Times that was, and um, you must have seen it yesterday. It's a very, it was a long article. So I have a little bit more knowledge than I did two days ago. 
Great. And I'm glad to be here. We're glad you're here too. Um, now I'm going to skip over Ben to Bruce Daly. Okay. Well, I'm I'm very happy to be here. Um, I am a reader of science fiction. That's uh, that's why I love being part of this group. And uh, and I want to um, plug Bill's Bill Adams's book, The Reluctant Android, which is um, it's yeah. when I when I saw today's topic, I thought, okay, um, Bill has uh, Bill has um, he's got a really great exploration out there, and uh, um, I'll I'll put this up in the chat. Wait, I did put it up in the chat. Okay, <laughs> take taken care of already. And uh, um, I'm a retired math professor from the University of Arizona. And I have a lot of interest in getting youngsters interested in science and math. And I drive school buses full of exciting um, hands-on activities for kids. And, uh, but uh, science fiction is one of the best ways to get kids interested in science. So um, that's, I mean, it's fun. We don't have need a reason for science fiction, but there are, <laughs> actual reasons for science fiction. So it's great to be here. And, uh, and thanks, uh, Professor Coopers for joining us. Kuipers, by the way. Kuipers, Kuipers. It, I, our family pronounces it with a long I, just Kuipers. Uh, like, Although uh, Dutch pronounce it as Kuipers, but that's not an English vowel. Oh, okay. That's uh, like Gerard Kuiper, the opt optical scientist in Arizona. Gerard Kuiper, the, the, he pronounced, their family pronounces it Kuiper, closer to Kuiper, and he, he is so famous, look him up, Gerard Kuiper, founder of Planetary Astronomy, well, you may already know about him. Anyway, okay, moving on, Ian Kennedy. Hello there, um, I'm in South Africa, um, currently one of my side interests is the ethics of AI and whether you can build ethics into AI, so I'm looking forward to this talk. Great. Okay, um, Eva. And don't forget to un unmute, Eva. Yes, Hello, I'm, uh, I'm on false pretenses here. I was invited by Evelyn Drake and I'm really looking forward to it. I read a lot, but I don't read that much of science fiction. And I think suspect my science fiction uh, is more fiction than science. So well, I like, um, Different sort of it's it's more more about the the fiction and about the people or the people in it rather than the science, which is funny because I'm a retired medical doctor. I'm a I used to be a family doctor in England, and as you can hear from my accent, I'm not native speaker. I uh, I'm Czech originally, created from communist Czechoslovakia when when it was still communist. Ruth so, Ruthicheski, <laughs> And uh, I'm looking forward to it because it's the artificial intelligence is very interesting, but my interest is more the, the human and the com communication and things like this rather than the science. So well, Carl, Carl Chopek invented the word robot, a Czech uh, playwright. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but yes. where are you, Eva? If I may I'm ask. in London in my garden. Oh, and beautiful. It's uh, I'm London getting colder now it's half past five in the afternoon so i think i might move from my garden to the house but it's we have we're having a as the british say a tropical conditions because of course the weather is always very dramatic here so the weather isn't but the comments are so we have siberian conditions in the oh. winter tropical summers but not really wonderful i'm so glad you're here and i hope you'll come again okay thanks for having me thank you this is my own my own cheering squad, my husband and son. Okay, Bob, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, I'm Bob, uh, glorious husband. I'm a retired astronomer and reader of science fiction. Okay, I guess that's all Bob wants to say. Chris, are you there? Sometimes Chris puts in an appearance and then walks away. <laughs> Chris, hello. Well, we may go back to what or not. Uh, Nancy. Uh, hi, I'm a retired data processing person from years ago. Once upon a time, majored in math. And uh, right now I'm invisibling myself since I had just had Mo's surgery. Oh. So it's not particularly appealing. <laughs> so I figured this is a good day to be invisible. 
but I did want to hear today's presentation, which sounded very interesting. Oh, well, thank you so much for coming. And Evelyn? Is Evelyn here? Yes. Uh, I'm a retired chemist. I live in New Jersey. I attended um, the uh, Tucson Festival of Books when this uh, group was formed. And I put my name on a, a sheet of paper and I've been getting your emails ever since. I regret that I uh, was regretting that I didn't you know, live close enough to uh, go to your meetings. And then the pandemic happened. So things became online, which is a benefit. So I'm, I'm very glad to participate today. I did go online last night and look up Benjamin. Mm -hmm. And I especially enjoyed the uh, video of the intelligent wheelchair. Oh, good. Uh, on your website. That was fascinating. So uh, I'm, I, the whole range of things you might speak to today, I'm very interested in. Well, thank you. Oh, we have two more people who are just coming in. So uh, if you don't mind, we'll include no, that's fine. introductions. Um, okay, now we have Carrie uh, Myers, who just came in. I, I think maybe she's already able to hear us. Carrie, are you there? Hello, Carrie. Well, we're not getting a response from Carrie. She is here. Maybe she hasn't completely logged in. How about Elaine? Elaine, are you there? I wonder what's up. Well, the two new ones. Oh, I know they're they're muted. I can unmute them. Please unmute, Carrie. If you're there. Well, Chris, are you there now? Well, okay. So we have <laughs> what are, oh, Carrie. There's Carrie. There you go. Hi, Carrie. Hi. Hi, Gloria. Sorry we're, to just, be... we're just doing introductions. So you can tell about your illustrious organizational background here. <laughs> Right now, um, I well, I'm I have been running this organization called Tucson Area Physics Teachers, and trying to get someone not retired to run it now. So, but um, we're working on that. And um, right now, I'm in Colorado actually, and uh, so uh, that's what I've been working on is trying to hand that over to somebody who's still working, who's going to be. Um, Scott Sawyer at Pima. So anyway, I'm a physics teacher and uh, really enjoy the science fiction group. <laughs> Thank you so much. And it looks like now we can see Elaine. And Elaine, I don't know, if, have you been to our meetings before? Okay, okay, well, Elaine, do you want to introduce yourself? We're just going through introductions. Oh, now I can unmute myself. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Before I said you that, uh... I couldn't unmute myself. Yeah, I'm. Um, I'm here as a, at the suggestion of another one of the participants who told me about this uh, happening going on today, and it sounded very, very interesting, given the many areas of uh, exploration of this world that we share. Okay. Well, thank you for coming, Elaine, and I hope you'll come back because I want to tell you a forecast. We're going to have Benjamin and. David Gunkel back, I think in October, isn't it, Benjamin? Yeah, that's right. Uh, if I'm right. And they will be taking on more, more aspects of, you know, will they take over or not, you know, about robots. So um, I will just introduce my son. I don't know. I guess he's not really here. I, I'm here. Can you hear oh, okay. me? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm an architect in Los Angeles and I'm Gloria's son. And my audio wasn't working, but nice to meet you all. <laughs> okay. okay. Hi, Chris. I didn't mean to say, make assumptions there. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to uh, our speaker, Benjamin Kuipers, who is the, um, I always get which engineering department confused because I don't have it in front of me, but I guess it's okay. elect electrical engineering. No, it's, it's actually computer science and engineering Oh, okay. at, at the okay. University of Michigan. Right, wonderful university, and we're so pleased to have you, and now you sort of know who we are, too. Great, and thank turn you. Turn it over to you, then. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to use slides. So um, I made myself an outline and um, I will <laughs> follow it and we'll see what happens. So the first topic is really who am I? 
Well, I was raised in the 50s and 60s, um, like many of you. I was a big science fiction fan. I was also a big math fan. And I got all excited by the notion that we would be able to have a mathematics of the mind. And then I went to college and took a psychology course and decided that, well, that was no good. <laughs> because the interesting parts weren't rigorous and the rigorous parts weren't interesting. So I went into pure math and went to graduate school. And while I was there, I encountered the AI lab, the artificial intelligence lab. This was at MIT. And I got completely seduced because I felt that artificial intelligence had encountered a math a kind of math symbolic programming at the time that was suitable for building a science of the mind. And so I did my PhD thesis there and I'd, <clears throat> I focused my attention on common sense knowledge because that seemed to me to be a key part of what intelligence was gonna turn out to be. And I spent a bunch of time, the year, decades have gone by and I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at common sense knowledge of space, of objects, of actions, and so forth. And in the last decade or so, I've started looking at some more social aspects of common sense knowledge, which involve things like theory of mind. And um, eventually, I focused on ethics, which is I'm treating it as a category of knowledge of um, a category of common sense knowledge. So just like knowledge of space helps you figure out how to get from A to B, knowledge of ethics helps you determine whether something you're considering doing is okay or not okay. So <clears throat> that's in a nutshell who I am and how I come to this stuff. And so then I wanted to say, well, what am I assuming about you guys? Now, I've heard you introduce yourselves, and uh, some of you are science fiction writers, lots of you are science fiction readers, and lots of you are interested in science fiction. Um, I've been struck by a quote that I heard from somebody. Um, this is a sort of mixed compliment. <laughs> this, and, and he said, science fiction writers are the most important writers of the age. But then he went on to say, if only some of them could write. <laughs> now, I remember this as being Kurt Vonnegut, and, but I, I haven't been able to track down the quote. So if you can find it for me, I would really, really appreciate knowing a source for that quote. Um, now, why are science fiction writers the most important writers? Well, it's because you guys explore the possible futures and they help and you help us understand what those possible futures might mean um and so if you think about the stuff that i've been reading about since i was growing up space travel atomic power alien races superpowers and how might society respond to this kind of thing we need this We've needed this throughout my whole lifetime, and it looks to me like we need it now more than ever. And so that's part of what I want to talk about today. Um, so why do we worry about ethics? Well, a bunch of people have raised issues about dangerous or scary artificially intelligent agents or robots. And so this goes back to the golem, um, to Frankenstein, to the Sorcerer's Apprentice, to R-U-R, -R, the, the, the play that coined the word uh, robot. And <clears throat> so this raises questions in people's minds about the kinds of dangers that we might get from robots of various descriptions, and the question of whether ethics can save us from these, from these problems. And so one of the first pieces of science fiction that really explored this very carefully um, was Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics. And those <clears throat> fit actually quite nicely 
into one of the major philosophical approaches, one of the major approaches to philosophical ethics, um, which is called deontology, but it's actually just Greek for duties. So what are your duties as a person? Um, and so Asimov lays out what the duties of a robot are. Now, when you start reading a stuff, a bunch of stuff about philosophical ethics, which I did starting, oh, <clears throat> roughly a decade ago, um, you discover there are, are major schools of thought. And I can summarize the, the, the three most conspicuous ones as dealing with virtues, dealing that a person should have, dealing with utilities that a person might want to maximize, or duties that a person might have and, and be supposed to follow. Now, you, there are other schools of thought, including things like contracts, um, and so forth. But I'm not going to try to give you my thumbnail sketch of philosophy on this. Um, now, it turns out when people start trying to implement ethical reasoning for artificially intelligent agents or for robots, they often end up focusing on utility maximization. And that's called utilitarianism in the philosopher world. Um, but it's, it's a very congenial kind of reasoning for people in computer science, artificial intelligence, and so forth. And so what you have to do is you say, OK, here's a utility function, something which represents goodness. Um, and some of the early philosophers sort of said that the utility would be pleasure minus pain. Um, and that's they call that hedonic utility. But, um, <clears throat> but it turns out that you can make that almost anything, and people do. Um, very popular um, measures are things like profit, um, or the score in a game, or um, years of lifespan, or other kinds of things. One of the lessons that I've gotten out of looking at this is that it's absolutely critical to get the utility right. And that if you are maximizing a utility that is badly chosen, you can end up picking actions that actually are going to cause a lot of trouble. Um, and that may very well lead to some of the problems um, that we see. So I'm going to focus here on utility maximization. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that um, there's a mathematical method, which many of you are undoubtedly familiar with, called game theory, which was uh, which is designed to analyze interactions between agents or among maybe sometimes it's just two agents, sometimes it's more agents. This idea is inspired by the notion of recreational games. So if we play checkers, then there's a score. Or if we're playing tennis, there's a score. Um, if we're playing an even simpler game like matching pennies or something, then you either match or you don't match and um, you get and somebody wins and somebody loses. One thing that's quite characteristic about recreational games is that they are what's called zero sum. If you win, I lose. If I win, you lose. And so win, lose, and, and draw are typically the only possible outcomes for a zero-sum game. And there's good reasons why recreational games are typically designed that way. Not always, but typically. Now, but the game theory framework can also accommodate games that are not zero-sum. And if we think of various kinds of exploitation, 
So exploitation is typically negative sum. So if I win, you lose, but you lose more. So if I come and break into your house and steal some lovely thing and take it off and sell it to a fence or something, I'm going to get a very small fraction of the actual value. So I get something, but you lose a lot more than that. And so that's a negative sum game. On the other hand, we can have positive sum games that are win-win situations. So if you and I combine forces to do something, whether this is like a barn raising or we're out hunting together or we are um, uh, writing a book and one person is writing it and another one is being the, the beta reader and giving them editing comments, then that's a collaboration that ends up being a positive sum outcome. Everybody wins. Um, now, <clears throat> one of the things, let me just get this. One of the things that influenced me on this, and I'd recommend this book. Um, this is a book called Non-Zero by Robert Wright. Came out in the year 2000. And he starts with this notion of positive, negative, and zero-sum games, focusing on positive-sum games, and says that this really drives human destiny over the centuries and millennia. Uh, and he makes a very interesting argument, so I'd recommend reading it. Um, one of the very interesting things about this is that when you think of a game in terms of the overall sum, you should look not just at who the players are and which player is going to come out ahead or behind, but you should look at the overall society that this game is embedded in. And so the society can win more if there is more cooperation going on, because then however the two participants allocate their respective shares, the society comes out ahead. So if there's lots of cooperation going on, if there are many cooperative games taking place, the society is getting more and more prosperous. If a lot of the games that are going on are exploitative, then the society as a whole, each time one of those games takes place, the society ends up having a net loss. Even if one of the players comes out ahead because the other player has lost more than the one player has gained. So in order to function well, a society needs to encourage positive sum games. Now, in fact, economists, particularly economists of development, know all about this, and they talk about it often in terms of the economic value of the rule of law. Because if you are in a society where the rule of law is very weak, then exploitation is very common, and often economic interactions end up being exploitative so the winner wins something, but the loser loses more. Whereas when you get positive sum cooperative interactions, and these are sometimes like teamwork, but if you think about it, trade, anytime you trade something with someone else, you're each giving up something that you desire less than the thing you're getting from the other person. So, every, so the net sum total of happiness goes up. So this gives us a way to look at how the society as a whole is doing. And society wins by encouraging cooperation as a predominant form of interaction among its members. And it loses when exploitation becomes a predominant 
mode of interaction. So if it's positive sum, it's society that has the positive sum distributed among its members. Um, and as these interactions go on, the society gets better and better. But let's think about cooperation. Cooperation requires vulnerability. And so one of the things I had been considering here was to teach you a little bit more in more detail about uh, game theory, but I, I was sure I would run, up, run way out of time. But <clears throat> um, if you're gonna cooperate with somebody else, then you typically are vulnerable to them failing you and deciding to exploit you instead. So cooperation in requires trust, which is defined here as willingness to accept vulnerability, confident that that vulnerability will not be exploited. So that's a very particular definition of trust and trust has many different definitions, but bear with me here. This is the relevant definition for us. Now, if you trust somebody else and are willing to enter into a cooperative enterprise with them, then what you're hoping, what you're having faith in is that that other person will be trustworthy. So trust pays off if the other person is trustworthy. That means trust is justified. And if you're not trustworthy, then it wasn't justified. You get exploited and you, you decide not to do that again. So now finally we get around to what is the role of ethics? So my claim here is that Ethics is a body of knowledge that the society has and it teaches to its members that teaches the members of society how to be trustworthy and how to recognize when other people are trustworthy. And so a society chooses an ethical system. And it tries to convey that ethics to the people in the society. And if it succeeds, then it gets more cooperation. And if it fails, it produces less cooperation. Now, if you think about the fact that we have lots of societies around this world and lots of societies over history, and those, the ethics in those societies has changed dramatically over the years. So a society is going to succeed or fail, really in part, not totally, but in part, according to how well its ethics does at encouraging cooperation and particularly encouraging cooperation among more and more members of the society. Because then those cooperations are gonna produce more resources, which are going to allow the society to meet various challenges and opportunities. And so when that works, the society does well. When that doesn't work, the society does poorly. And this should be starting to remind you of an evolutionary process. So if you are, let's say you are a, a large predatory cat, having sharp front teeth is a big win. But if your sharp front teeth get too long, then they start getting in your way and you do less well. And so we don't find the saber-toothed tiger in the world anymore. Similarly, as societies, 
up until about, let's say, 300 years ago, every society on earth essentially believed that slavery was a perfectly reasonable role for a person to have within that society. Sucks to be a slave, obviously. You don't want to do it if you can avoid it, but it's there's it was considered to be a perfectly ethical relationship. You're just on the bottom end. Um, now, starting several centuries ago, um, a few people started saying, no, no, this is wrong. Some people should not own other people. And they were criticized and ignored, and everybody figured that they were a, a radical fringe, and you don't have to think about that. But as the centuries went by, that idea started to catch on, and there were revolutions and civil wars and changes, and now at this point in history, I won't say that we're free of the uh, negative consequences of that horrible institution, but it is generally recognized by almost everybody that that institution is wrong. And so even people who practice slavery or practice enslaving other people know that they're doing something wrong and that they'd better try hard not to get caught at it. Um, and so you can think of other cases of, um, of ethical change. So societies whose ethics said slavery was fine have largely died out. Societies whose ethics said human sacrifice is fine have largely died out. And societies that, who for various reasons, we could spend more time on this, um, encourage more cooperation among more people seem to be thriving. So the more that happens, we get an evolutionary process, things work better. Now, I talked a little bit about resources to meet challenges and opportunities. Now, as a society, we're facing some really serious challenges. And so some of those are serious enough that we should call them existential threats. And so climate change is obviously a major one of those. Infectious diseases is another one. Nuclear war, even though we have been succeeding in muddling through for the last half century or so, um, is yet another existential threat. And there are more. But these are threats that are going to require cooperation in order to meet. And we need to ask ourselves, does the ethics of our society support a level of trust that will support the cooperation to avoid those existential threats? Will our society survive? Maybe, maybe not. Um, now, <clears throat> I started all this thinking about um, robots and what it is that I would want to implement in robots. But in order to answer that question, I found myself saying, well, what is ethics anyway? Why do we have it? What role does it play? What benefit does it provide? And I've just told you the answer that I've come up with. Now, this seems to apply primarily to humans and how humans relate to each other. But I think it's more than that. That I think <clears throat> when we create robots that interact with other members of society, they interact as members of our society, then they will also have to demonstrate that they are trustworthy. 
Now, at the moment, we're looking into the future because we can't build robots like that yet. We can build AI systems that do consequential things and try to figure out how to make them trustworthy. And that's another long talk. And if, if you ask questions on that, I'll, I'll go into that. But I think there's another ingredient that's worth thinking about here. And one is, Robots and artificially intelligent systems are not the only major AI systems that we need to worry about. There are other kinds of systems that already take a dominant role in our society, and those are corporate entities. And I, I use that complicated term because I don't just want to say for-profit corporations, but I do want to include them, but I also want to include governments and nonprofits and a whole churches and a whole bunch of other stuff. These are artificial. They are goal-oriented. They are problem solvers. They're not digital computers, although they may use digital computers. They're not people, but they use people as components. And so, and they, unlike robots today, obviously have a major dominant role in our society. And they have strong ethical beliefs, some of which may very well be inappropriate. But again, that's another long discussion. Now, what I wanted to ask, and then I'll stop for, for discussion, is what should science fiction writers do about this? Well, I believe that the important role of science fiction writers is to explore our possible futures and to make it clear what some of the problems are, make it clear what some of the possible solutions are, lay out consequences of those things. Now, I've, I've read um, a very interesting book a, a little while ago. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson wrote The Ministry of the Future, for the Future. And many of you have probably already read that, right? Oh, how many have? Raise your hand. Okay. Well, I recommend it. It's essentially a procedural. It's not a police procedural, but it's a political procedural about addressing um, climate change over a period of decades. Um, and I think it does a nice job. But there are plenty of other issues in this space that I would love to see um, people exploring. So why don't I stop here and see what kinds of questions people have. And I'd be happy to talk further on any portion of this. Thank you. And people are welcome to unmute. unmute. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ben. We're so appreciative of this talk. And you know, I want to, re I want to thank you in advance for coming back with um, David Gunkel in October, because then those things you said are a separate talk you don't have time for today. Maybe yes. make a list of some of those and we'll get to those in October with right. David. And uh, those of you who don't know who David Gunkel is, look him up. I think he's at Princeton. Where is he? He's somewhere back east. I don't know. But anyway, um, yes. So questions. Um, I have one. Okay, Ian. Thank you. Um, first of all, a very interesting presentation. It should have much more um, uh, audience than we've got, what we've got tonight. And um, my question is about how to learn whether to trust a person or not. It seems to me that at no stage in my career have I been to a trustworthiness assessment 101 class. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of any stage during my career when my parents, my teachers, 
my mentors, my society have said, look, you must learn how to trust a person and what the signs of trustworthiness are. Um, I suppose I, in my own life, I've given a few little things to people and seen what they've done in return. In my own little society here, um, a neighbor has given me a book when I first visited him as a sign of uh, his trustworthiness. And I've exchanged and so on and so the trustworthiness is built up. But nobody teaches that. Well, what are your comments on this? Well, isn't that a shame? Now, in fact, we do learn, we do learn implicitly um, how to assess trustworthiness because we, we watch how people respond to our trust. It seems, it seems fairly clear that people actually have a bias in favor of extending trust even before they have the evidence. Now, what's important is to do it about something that's not critically important. So I lend you a book and I discover, do you give it back? I actually had somebody I lent a paper back to, and he came back to me and he said, um, oh, I finished that paperback. It was really good. So I gave it to the to the used bookstore. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> I saved those things. <laughs> but I've never lent him anything else. And <clears throat> one of the things that somebody observed, and this was actually a philosopher who pointed out if you look, there are game theory models like the prisoner's dilemma, which show how a person who exploits other people will do better. And therefore, you should, you should really exploit other people. And he says, well, actually, our experience is quite the contrary. And the, answer, and the reason why that happens is if you are... If you develop a reputation as an exploiter, you are no longer offered opportunities that other people are offered. And so this business of assessing trustworthiness takes place quite implicitly. I think you make a very valuable observation that we're not teaching it explicitly, and I'll bet teaching it explicitly would be a very valuable thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I could I ask Bob's question? I turned it into a question from a statement. He said that most likely the robots that we're going to be dealing with in the majority will not be like physical beings that, that are out there running around. They will be in devices. And how can we test devices and uh, in the cloud, the cyber cloud for their quote trustworthiness? Ah, well, that's a, that's a very good question. I distinguish robots and other AIs that are primarily programs running somewhere uh, according to whether they perceive and act in the physical world, because the physical world contains a huge amount more information than you would receive through the interfaces of a computer. Um, and so... So robotics really forces you to deal with that question of the abstraction from the world to whatever is, is coming into the computer. Um, but I still think that, that roughly the same methods apply, but you have to be paying attention. So there was a dramatic case in the state of Michigan where I live about a decade ago, um, the agents, the state government agency that assesses, that decides whether people get unemployment insurance, decided to renovate their system and create a computerized system that would assess these claims. And the people who built that system um, <clears throat> receive a questionnaire filled out by the claimant and another questionnaire that's filled out by the employer. And the programmers decided that if there was any discrepancy between those two forms, 
that was going to be considered evidence of fraud by the claimant. <laughs> I see Ian covering his face in a totally justified way. Um, <clears throat> now, this came to the attention actually of a professor at our School of Social Work who then looked into it more and um, discovered that in many cases, the employer was perfectly happy to have um, the applicant receive those benefits, although it costs them, but um, because they deserved it. Um, and, but they had filled out the form in slightly different ways. The software decided that there was fraud. It sent a letter to the last known address of the applicant and asked the applicant to return that letter with evidence. Um, if it didn't get returned, then the system concluded that that was, um, that that really was fraud. So it's essentially convicting them of a crime. And it was able to levy um, triple damages. So would claw back the benefits that the person already was receiving and levy triple damages. This did an enormous amount of harm, really destroying people's lives. They finally got the attention of um, a federal regulatory agency that did a major audit and discovered that these decisions were 93% wrong. Now, by this time, <clears throat> the money that had been reclaimed from these victims had gone into the state budget and the state had used it in order to balance their budget. And so they were very reluctant to give that money back. So this has been winding its way out and I think it's, it's coming to a slightly more positive outcome, but it's taken years and many people's lives have suffered enormously from it and we need better processes. You can look at that particular situation and you can, <clears throat> and you can think of actual evaluation and certification processes that you would have to put in place before a system like that would be deployed. And of course, if you look at the AI ethics research community, people are writing many, many papers on topics that are like that. And there is some hope that, um, that attention will be increasingly paid to it and that this will be um, improved. I'm not sure if it'll be fixed. Does that answer your question? Well, uh, whoever asked that, I'm losing track what with doing so many things. I okay, that's fine. Answered your question. Um, is there, fine. are there any other questions? I'm trying to remember to check the, uh, um, chat, and I don't see any other in chat. Are, are there any other questions from people? Bill Adams has a hand up. Sure, I have a question. I want to thank you for the comparison of uh, AI systems to uh, corporate entities. That's really interesting and helpful, and uh, I'd like to learn more about that. Um, Incidentally, if you if you send me a request, I can actually send you a paper I wrote about it some time ago. Thank you. I'll do that. Thank you. Well, could yeah. could you send it to our whole group? I would love to send it out to sure. everybody. Okay. Sure. Yes. Yeah. I see Eva me. going. Oh yes, yes. Because okay. that was that kept going through my mind for a week. You know, comparing robots with corporate personhood, yeah. and I know that's an important precedent. So. Um, I want to mention about Bill Adams. I think he may be a robot because he said he has seven science fiction novels out this year. Seven. Oh, very good. <laughs> yeah, they're not this year, but but oh. they're recent and oh, uh, recent. okay. They're all recent, and uh, thank you for mentioning them. I yeah, put the so check out there. check out his um, presence there on Amazon. You just type in Bill Adams and uh, 
books or science fiction it'll come okay up. i'll do that so bill i think i interrupted you before you had finished your question well it's kind of a rambling question um the question is really about the, the people that are behind the device or the corporation and uh the question of ethics of ai is to me really about the question of can we trust the people behind the, the designers for example because right. like my my gps system in my car always wants to choose the fastest route mm -hmm. i'm more interested in the safest route mm -hmm. but it says we found a way that's four minutes faster would you like that and so there's the designers adding implicit assumptions into the design which biases the system for my needs so that's the question how do you get at the ethics of either robots or corporations when what you really need to get at is the ethics or the ignorance, just the sheer ignorance of the designers. Right, that's a very good question. And it gets at <clears throat> a very closely related issue, which is the ambiguity of the word trust. So the way I've defined trust is trust in the decisions of another agent. So, and I use the word agent instead of person because I want to include things like corporations or, um, or intelligent robots. Um, but you might also say, um, I trust um, my climbing rope to be strong enough to catch me to hold if I fall. Or I trust this sensor that I'm going to put on a wheelchair that it will give me an accurate measurement and it will give it to me with this degree of accuracy and with this speed and so forth. And that second kind of trust really is uh, very closely related to the designer and the manufacturer. And um, it really comes down to trust in the agent behind building the instrument. So one kind of trust deals with inanimate objects performing a function. Another kind of trust um, deals with agents deciding what to do. If you trust me, you're saying, I'm going to trust that you're going to behave cooperatively instead of exploitatively. Um, and so, and I have the decision. I can, I can make that decision either way, but you trust that I'm going to be cooperative instead of exploitative. Um, so I think when you're thinking about various objects, the, the real question is, is it functioning as an agent? Is it making decisions within a certain context and where it has alternatives? Like a self-driving car actually is perceiving its context, it's deciding what its situation is like, and it's making a decision what to do in order to pursue its own goals. Um, and that's different from the, the sensor, which was built to detect objects in certain directions at certain distances and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so I think you can distinguish between those according to whether you're talking about agents or inanimate objects. And in the case of inanimate objects, then the thing you need to trust is the manufacturer, which includes the designer and the, and so forth. But you also know that, um, you have when you're dealing with merchants of various kinds who sell you, let's say, computers uh, or telephones or whatever, that some of them you may trust and some of them you may not trust on the grounds that some of them are, are building and selling shoddy equipment. And some of them sell, build and sell equipment that's going to last you a long time. I was once I, I was once told a, a good principle when you're buying a tool for your for your workshop is buy 
the best one, the highest quality you can afford, because that one will last you for the rest of your life. If you buy a screwdriver or a chisel or something and you save as much money as you can, then it's going to break and you're going to have to buy another one. And so I think that concept of a tool helps you think about when to trust. Uh, Tim, you're muted. You're muted. Mute yourself, Tim, or I can do it. Wait, wait. Uh, Tim, Tim, where's Tim? Oh, Tim, okay. there okay. you go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for your presentation. I, um, I'm, I'm, I, I was, I want to talk about those major existential threats that you mentioned. Yeah. Where society needs to cooperate in order to do well. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, climate change and infectious diseases and, and nuclear threats. Um, I, 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 when you said infectious diseases, I, I, I'm assuming, um, you know, the most recent thing is about the coronavirus and all of that. Well, I Where, think the coronavirus is, is, is a first step and there's a lot more infectious diseases coming down the road. All right. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we, we, we are just, uh, went through the coronavirus, uh, pandemic and stuff and and most people trusted the experts and trusted the government trusted the corporations trusted you know the you know and they were really scared to to kind of enforce this trust there was a a very uh, concerted effort that most uh, media, most government officials around the world, especially in the Western societies. And when we, when in, over the two, two and a half years, we started to discover people at least to break through the wall of that, that big lockstep, that uh, what they've been telling us is not really um, what is happening. You know, I mean, Dr. Fauci said, you know, trust me, I am science, you know, and they, 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 they brought a, a, a vaccine um, that, you know, essentially uh, forced most people to take it, whether, um, you know, people were scared just to take, take it because they trusted what they're saying or forced because they would have lost, lost their job. So this manipulation of trust is a very interesting phenomenon. Yes. In, in my opinion, it's, it, there is a, a concerted effort to not only trust me, but I'm not gonna allow you to think outside the box because you are only allowed to think and see what I'm telling you. And, um, I find that uh, very disturbing. And mm -hmm. uh, as we can see, you know, the, 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 um, the trust in the vaccine has way went down. They told us it was safe and effective, 95%. People took it and then they changed why you have to take it and they keep changing and keep changing. What do you think this is happening and where is the role of the other agents in all of this, government, NGOs, yeah. the media, and all of that. Okay, thank you for that question. That's, I think it's a very good question. And it raises a number of very interesting points. Um, um, and, and that are very relevant when we're dealing with um, large problems like existential threats. Um, and part of the problem is that <clears throat> we, have, we have large agencies that have to make decisions 
um, that, that have to make public policy decisions about how to address those threats. And we're making those decisions at times of incomplete knowledge. So anyone who actually has to make consequential decisions knows that they are making those decisions only with incomplete knowledge and that that knowledge develops over time and you learn more um, about the actual situation. But you often have to make a decision at a point in time. And you make that decision based on the best information you have. And sometimes it's right, many times it's right, and sometimes it's wrong. And now part of earning trust if you start out in that position of trust, is to be <clears throat> able to communicate to people when you are right, when you are wrong, what degree of, of knowledge and understanding you have, and then you correct your position. So, um, so in fact, the the vaccines, to the best of my knowledge, have in fact been quite both safe and effective. Now, that doesn't mean they've been perfectly safe and perfectly effective. And of course, the, 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 the virus has been evolving. Um, our understanding of the effect of the virus, of the vaccine on the virus and on the population has been evolving. Um, and what we need to do is to be, is to develop better ways to say, here's my best judgment at this moment in time, and I will, <clears throat> um, and if I learn more information in the future, then I will update that judgment. So all of us, oh, all, let, let me just say a, just a little bit more. I mean, all of us at our ages <clears throat> stand a significant risk of finding ourselves going to the hospital with something major. And then we're going to have to ask the doctors, what should we do? Should I be operated on? Should I accept some kind of chemotherapy? Should I just take two aspirin and call you in the morning? Um, <clears throat> and that doctor is also a finite human being. And the nature of that interaction is gonna have to recognize A, that is not going to be perfect, but B, that it should be updated and improved incrementally as they learn more. Now, one thing that has happened politically <clears throat> that I see as a big problem, I certainly agree that if what they're doing is they're saying, oh, you have to believe me because I'm the expert and you can't even raise a question, then that's wrong because that encourages distrust. At the same time, I think that there are political efforts to say, these people have been wrong sometimes, therefore we should never trust them. And I think that's also wrong because if you never trust, then you can't engage in the kind of cooperative activities that come out better in the future. So any treatment is going, even if something is spectacularly successful, 90% successful, that means 10% of the time it fails. And so if you look at that 10% and you say, oh, I'm never going to trust a doctor again, you're making a serious mistake. And... <clears throat> Again, on average, you will do much worse. And so if the society 
is sympathetic to a position that says, if someone makes a mistake, we will never ever trust them again, that society is very likely to do very badly. So okay. I think, um, I, okay. I, I just wanted to point out that Ava has had her hand up for a long time and she also had something about Isaac and Abraham in the chat which then started a whole thread about whether it was trust or obedience. And I don't know, are you still interested in that part of it, Eva, or would, did you have a different question? You're muted. I had a different question. I think for me, uh, I'm a physician, obviously, and what we learned in medical school, I graduated in 1977, half of it is no longer true. And the same was when I was in medical school, we laughed at some of the things doctors did 50 years before us, because uh, they thought they were scientifically proven. And in fact, there was that scientifically proven that it's not the case. And I think one has to have doubt I think faith is quite dangerous in this sort of uh, situation. Trust is a bit different, but again, the terms trust can, cannot be complete because, because basically we don't know and we don't know what we don't know. So there is always a question of why do I have this treatment? There are these good reasons for it. And we, as far as we know, there are no dangerous side effects. But as far as me, we know, doesn't mean that they can't be, of course. And mm -hmm. so I think faith in science is, is a dangerous conception. I think science is to be questioned and questioned and questioned and tested again and again. And if we start believing in what's said to us in science, we stop being inquisitive and be much more likely to make mistakes. So I think the trust and belief is something which we could, we should control a bit. And I think generally, I mean, maybe it's because I grew up in a communist country, but I think skepticism is quite a useful tool. I, I would agree that asking questions is central to science. And so the argument that trust in science means if a scientist says it, it must be true, that's just wrong. And, and I, think, I don't think that there's a scientist who would defend that position. Um, <clears throat> so I think we have to be careful to... Let's see, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm afraid I'm losing the thread slightly, that we don't want to simply accept what someone says because I'm a scientist, so you need to believe me. Correct. I, I, have a, I, I want to insert something here because I think it is important. I gave a talk at the Jet Propulsion Labs post-secondary directorate in about 2009, and my talk was called Goodbye to Frankenstein. It was all about the almost hatred the humanities have of science because of the bomb and various other authoritarian patriarchal structures within science. And I work because my husband's an astronomer and I'm, an, I'm in the humanities between the two. So if anybody's interested, just put your email in the chat and I will send you that talk called Goodbye to Frankenstein. It also gives who are allies and who are criticizing science for precisely books, I cite books and references, who the feminists are, who the other players are from various points on the compass who have no faith in science. Some of them are very educated people like uh, Firestein, Fireoven, what's his first name? I can't think of his first name. Mm -hmm. Goodbye to rationality. He's at the University of Vienna. So um, just pop your little addresses in and I will send you that copy of that PowerPoint. That was just a tie into what you're saying. Okay. Um, I think Bill Adams had put something into the chat about trust in any commercial actor is extremely difficult in a capitalist system like ours. This is true even for capitalist beneficial systems like medical providers, pharmaceutical companies, vitamin system, vitamin companies, food companies, and so forth. How can societal trust evolve under such a system? Well, 
ideally, in principle, um, if a company sells bad products and that becomes known, then people won't buy them. I mean, many years ago, Consumer Reports rated a certain SUV that was made by Suzuki as unacceptable. And that was a catastrophe for, for Suzuki. And they had to do a huge amount of stuff, in, including redesigning that vehicle in order to get that rating improved, which was critical to the, um, to the trust that people would have for that corporation. Similarly, you guys are old enough to remember when somebody poisoned Tylenol tablets. And what Johnson & Johnson did, and this I, I give them full credit for this, is they took all the Tylenol off the market. And they may have taken all their products off the market until they could change the nature of their packaging and make that impossible. Now, that was obviously a decision that had to be made at the CEO and board level because it was extraordinarily expensive. But I believe that that failure of trust was an existential threat to the company. And the company would have died if they hadn't done that. And it was to their credit that they did do it. And in some sense, it's to the credit of the capitalist system when it works that they felt that as a major threat that they had to respond to. Now, part of my problem with the capitalist system is that it has been, um, it has been distorted so that companies are protected from the consequences of their actions under a variety of circumstances and companies that should have suffered seriously and possibly fatally um, don't. Um, but that's a separate issue. Let's see. Do we have any further questions or comments? I think you did a fantastic job and you covered a lot of ground. So remember Ben to um, in October, when you come back, some of these things that just were too far off right. 